discussion mm -hmm. about this discussion is about how to make data work for farmers, particularly small farmers. My name is uh, Deepa Karthikeyan. I'm part of an organization called Athena Infonomics, uh, with a team committed to helping build strong data use systems and cultures that advance goals like equity, resilience, and sustainability. I'm excited to be here with an amazing panel that brings in such diverse experiences and expertise. Uh, sort of to have, I think, what's going to be a very fun conversation. We have with us, and I'm going to, Josh, lead with you, the senior digital advisor with the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security at USAID, who's been leading some really incredible work in this space. Um, we have Jonathan, who's a researcher and practitioner from Development Gateway, comes with a background in, on international law and has been thinking and advising actors in the space on how to build pharma-centric models of data governance. Jonathan, so Josh and Jonathan, great to have you with us. And then we have Rajesh, who brings really the perspective of a service provider. Rajesh is a technologist with over 20 years of experience in sectors like insurance, pharma, manufacturing. And in his current role, he sits on the board of a general insurance company called Shema, which is among the first public limited insurance service providers in India that's digitized all of its operations. So, And they've gone through this really interesting process of thinking about data governance uh, in the field in an interesting way. So we have three different perspectives, that of the donor, like a researcher, practitioner, and that of a service provider. So this is going to be a fun conversation. We want to invite Josh, Jonathan, and Rajesh to also maybe share a little bit about themselves before we uh, jump into the conversation. Josh, you want to kick us off? Yeah, thanks, Eva. You actually, I think you introduced me better than I could uh, myself. But um, so I'm just really pleased to be here. As um, you alluded to, so Jonathan and I worked together on a study on pharmacentric data governance that um, USAID co-funded with the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so I was one of the lead designers of the study, and then Jonathan actually did it and brought all of the uh, the insights to practice. So he did the harder um, part of the job. Um, so yeah, let me just keep it there briefly, but really pleased to be here. Jonathan, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deepa. And thank you, Josh. Uh, I, there's not a lot more to add from, from my part. Uh, you did a wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting us to, to, to be on this panel. Um, also worth noting is that uh, I did the work together with Athena and Economics, so uh, we both worked on this project. Um, yeah, um, so happy to talk more about it uh, in the coming hour. Awesome. Radish? Sure. Uh, thanks, Deepa. Thanks for the introduction and uh, bringing us on the panel. Uh, yeah, I mean, we are excited to participate in these forums because like uh, Deepa has mentioned, we are trying to do something different and we can definitely learn and share what we have been doing or what we are trying to do. So excited to get started. Awesome. I'm, you know, and I know, and I don't know if, I mean, and I want to make sure this is, a, I know this is not the sort of webinar where we have the time to bring in audience Q&A. Live. So give, I just want to let the audience members know that feel free just to keep putting your questions in on chat and I will try to weave in as much of that as possible conversation and to raise that and to discuss that with, with this, this really great group of panelists we have here with us. Um, I also, I mean, and maybe Sudhanshu from the organizing team can also drop a link because I don't know if you are all aware of the work that Jonathan and Josh led on pharmacentric data governance. I, I think it's an incredibly strong piece of research um, and I a lot of the conversation today is kind of around like sort of really focus on talking through what came out of that work and some of the other learnings and lessons from practitioners like like Rajesh. So Josh I want to lead with you right so this piece of work on pharmacentric data governance clearly is at the heart of why like the topic and the questions that I think this particular session is trying to get at what was the motivation right when USAID because there's a role in a vision that as USAID you have that you want to play in the space. So can you tell us more about that vision, the role, and also the motivation, therefore, to, to, to you know, to put out this piece of work? Sure. Thanks, Deepa. So I think, I mean, the study really came from a recognition that there's an increasing amount of farmer and farm data that's being digitized in the countries where USAID is primarily working, so in low and middle income countries. 
um, particularly as more and more farmers gain access to mobile phones in particular. Um, so we felt that, you know, it was really an opportunity to explore what are some of the other ways that data could be, uh, the governance of data could be more inclusive and generate greater value for all stakeholders. Um, you know, there's kind of the standard data governance model that most people are familiar with, which is, you know, you trade your data and you get access to a service. Um, but we wanted to look at, you know, what are some of those alternative models to data governance um, beyond that kind of standard model? And so with the study, we were really looking to understand what are some of the other data governance models that are already being tried uh, in agricultural contexts, uh, what the benefits of the different models are uh, as it relates to inclusion, empowerment, um, or value, shared value, uh, what are the underlying requirements of each one, uh, and when might they make sense to actually try to implement. Uh, so as part mm -hmm. of this study, and I'm sure Jonathan, you know, will talk more about this, but the team really looked into a number of real world examples of farmer centric data governance models in practice. Um, so it's not just a theoretical study, they were also capturing case studies on, you know, how these are actually being used. Um, although, you know, it is still very much, I think, early days of user centric data governance models, generally, I mean, not even mentioning with farmers, but sort of more broadly. So, you know, we were, the study isn't putting out, it's not meant to be the definitive, you know, this is what it, data governance should look like in all instances, if you want it to be more farmer centric, but rather to show a range of what's possible in this space. Why does this matter? Why should we be caring about their farmer or user centricity? Um, and then ex inspire others to explore and pilot these ideas further. I would hopefully take them beyond just sort of concepts and actually put them into practice. Awesome. That's, and I think this is actually a really nice segue, John, right, to Jonathan, to talk about, because, and I, I looked at the report and the technical work, and I think it's fantastic. And one of the, one of the things that you talk about is how there are few large corporations now that control so much of the farmer data in our food systems. And I'd love, love to just hear and learn more about just what came out of that. Like what, what's happening now in terms of data sharing and use? And what are the biggest threats that these current trends pose to small farmers? Uh, yeah, thank you, Deepa. You're, you're totally right. And there's a lot to say, so please please tell me if I if I go on a tangent. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, data-driven efforts are critical and they are an invaluable part of digitalization, right? So deploying these technologies can make farming uh, more profitable, practical, sustainable, and resilient. And digital ag tech has a lot of momentum and impetus and, and holds a lot of potential to strengthen the ag sector and also the livelihoods of small the farmers in the end. So the question is the, the question of like um, you know like what we looked at is like who owns the farm data and uh, that question in itself is a very contentious one. Um, you know though although, although farmers generate data through ag tech, um, developers are typically uh, the ones that own these data, and data shared between farmers and company largely flows from in in, in one direction from farmer to an organization or to a company. So data governance is at the core of uh, you know, agricultural technologies business model because it effectively determines the, 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 the technology's revenue structure. Um, the general consensus of on, on, uh, on the people that we spoke with is that farmers should own their own data about farm practices and the inputs and outputs. And conversations have pointed out that ownership includes how data is generated and used and how value is created and shared and what other opportunities they provide like like sovereignty and control and agency. So data ownership and control includes understanding data and its governance structure and explaining data ownership in a, in a format and a language that farmers understand is essential in that way. Um, regardless, the language of ownership or the word ownership can kind of distract from important issues of data collection, control and access. Building trust and confidence with, with farmers requires more than just clarifying what uh, data ownership means. And uh, for example, one can legally own data, but have little control over you know, how, it's, how it's used and, and, and who uses it. 
So if I'm mis with an understanding of data, uh, data use conditions, uh, such as like uh, ter terms, of li terms of licenses, are more willing to share their data. Um, contracts, uh, on the other hand, offer relatively weak data protections for farmers. You know, once data is, is no longer in, in the farmer's exclusive uh, possession, ownership provisions in contracts uh, and derive right effectively determine how this data can be used. It is unclear though, if farmer data has intellectual property protection, typically the, the type of property determines the owner's rights and responsibilities and not all data have copyright protection. While copyright law may provide for some protection sometimes like resulting from um, labor or skills or effort, um, raw data in, or information or knowledge or customs um, uh, are not protectable, uh, they're not a protectable subject matter. So ownership can, can vary by contract and provisions and can override these laws. And our research um, therefore focused mainly on sort of the meaning of power and, and in particular what, what meaningful control and ownership uh, entails. Um, and and to, to go into what your question more, um, we like to say that we live in an era where a select few hold uh, unprecedented, unprecedented control over farmer data and food systems. Um, so in a digitalized ag sector, some actors hold considerable higher levels of powers than others. And the pro proliferation of farm data, data only multiplies and magnifies some of the co concerns that we are witnessing, uh, witnessing in other sectors. So. Digitization may therefore redirect power and profits to those who already have it and therefore away from farmers, um, unless we take a deliberate steps to change the trajectory of data governance in our sector. So power dynamics and institutional factors also inform how the sector uses and uh, assesses the value of data, who collects and translates farm data into commercial value shapes farm systems and Reinforcing, potentially reinforcing structural in inequities. So in this sense, for us, meaningful farmer participation in digital innovations can shift the hegemonic paradigms away from a, a winner take all uh, agriculture towards a more sustainable, equitable, trustworthy and uh, more successful food system. Um, many ag tech servers offer to generate data for free, for example, because the data subject become part of this exchange and they use the latest software in return for giving up data and privacy and uh, farmers all over the world are uh, sometimes locked in into these ag tech platforms uh, having to adopt more and new uh, or new technologies and some view this as a data grab with ag tech providers intending to collect as much data as possible and to create opportunities for, for further data accumulation and expansion so weak data governance approaches uh, can undermine this trust and democracy and the data economy as a whole. And reflecting on these issues, you know, we have many questions like what does farmer data uh, ownership mean? Is it in the interest of farmers to provide data to those who share and sell it? Uh, is it preferable for a farmer to, uh, or, for, or for farmers organizations to control their own data? What level of participation in data governance should farmers have in farmer groups? Um, and yeah, em empowering farmers with more control uh, over their data is, a criti is critical to improving, their, uh, improving and protecting their livelihoods. And key to interrogating power structure is participation. And with that, I mean like involving people in influencing uh, decisions, processes, and practices related to data that, are, that's, that is affecting their life. However, uh, meaningful par uh, participation also requires that all stakeholders give farmers a voice in the data governance processes um, that affect their lives. So participation must seriously challenge ongoing structural inequality. And to create equ equitable, accountable, and just data, economy, uh, data economies in the ag sector, it is critical to um, reestablish uh, farmers' agency and control over their data and with an emphasis on the position of uh, marginalized people, especially smallholder farmers, um, their communities, and also uh, women and indigenous people, of course. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, John. That is such a, I mean, and I think you've touched on so many of the key 
bits at action equities, agency control and how, and you know, and I think not just in the ag space, but I think across different sectors, when there is a ambiguous or weak regulatory environment that is not enforced well, you're leaving businesses to start thinking about sort of what role can they play and what is the cost of playing that role and who bears that cost, right? What is the transaction cost of operationalizing a more equitable, um, open participatory system? Because this is not enforced by regulation or not necessary. And the cost of it is borne by, in a way, the digital ad company or a service provider. I'm hoping at some point investor disclosures and just the fear of markets become more and more powerful. But I think it's such an interesting conversation. And Rajesh, I think it's it'll it'll be great to your perspective because as a service provider, right? What are some of the like we this is awesome language. We love this, we want this. And these principles are important. And I we all believe in it. And I I know uh, from what I've seen of Shema that there is that you want to do this too as a service provider and you're a digitally enabled service provider in the ag space so i'd love to rajesh just i think it'll be great for the audience to hear more about what shema does like what's your core business model and then also just how do you think about because you collect a ton of data on your platform right both yep. and you combine spatial data with a ton of customer data so what's your what does shema do how how have you approached governance and you know how do you, farmers on your platform benefit from the data that you're collecting uh love to hear your perspectives on that Rajesh. sure sure deepa um so uh before i get into what shima does right i mean the core question about like hey like what, what's the i mean is customer really worried about the data being owned by any one company or vendor right I mean, given the amount of data that they share themselves over social media and over other avenues, I mean, right now, what we have seen is that the customer has resigned to the fact that majority of their information, it's available out there on the ether anyways, right? What they are more focused on is the value that they are getting out of this information that is out there, right? If a company is claiming that they, they have this data, right, what is the service they are getting out from them? Is the information being governed and secured without falling into the wrong hands? And most importantly, like Jonathan said, right? How is it going to improve their day-to-day -day life? Uh, especially when you look at it from a smallholder farmer perspective, right? So this is where uh, Shema with its agri uh, platform is focused on. Um, so we being an insurance company, our sole focus is going to be on risk management, right? So we always want to reduce, mitigate and manage the risk. And from a farmer perspective, that is their key focus as well, right? So they would want to make sure the crop that they are sowing for that season is successful and there are no issues and uh, make sure all the risks are mitigated along the way, right? So before, uh, so I, I just want to take a small detour and provide an overview of the approach that we are taking to this problem, right? So the first thing that we have did is like, we created a grid like of a 10 by 10 square meters for the whole country of India, right? I mean, Shema is focused primarily in Indian uh, market today, right? So our pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about is from that perspective, right? And then what we did was we collected a bunch of historical and uh, data attributes uh, that can be evaluated at that uh, grid cell level, right? So what we did, we have collected about like 20, 24 plus data points like cultivability of the land, the soil conditions, weather, crop, water bodies nearby. Most of the information that's available out there for anyone to be able to look at, right? But how we can make use of that for this specific task of providing insurance to the farmer for a specific farm for a crop for that season, right? So we collect all this information uh, so that it can all be evaluated at that grid cell level, right? And now when the customer tries to purchase something from us, the first thing we ask them is to provide us the boundaries of their farm and which we call as a polygon, right? Typically when it comes to insurance, at least in Indian submarket, it's primarily around like a specific region or specific village, things like that. But we are trying to focus it at the farm level, right? So what we did, what we do after that is we take the data from all these grid cells we extrapolate this at the polygon level. Now we have a way to assess the risk 
for that small piece of land, whether it is one acre, two acre, 10 acres, it really doesn't matter, right? Um, so we have the historical data associated with that region that we have collected over a period of time. And uh, we overlay that information with what this specific farmer is trying to do, right? And at this point, the premium is going to be calculated based on the risk score if this is the first time farmer, right? But if this is a repeat customer, that's when we take the other parameters into consideration, like what their cultivation um, uh, practices have been like and uh, things like that, right? So, and then what we do is once we present them the premium information, the key uh, differentiator at least we consider is we tell them how we came up with that premium, right? We present the top three attributes that has impacted the cost uh, or how we arrived at that specific premium value for that crop for that season, right? So the idea here is to provide the complete visibility into the whole process to the farmers themselves, right? The next step is uh, once the policy is sold, what we do is we leverage the satellite imagery to start analyzing that specific area on uh, how the crop has been progressing, growth has been progressing, right? So most of the companies, once the policy is sold, unless there is a claim, they really don't have to, don't uh, look at uh, analyzing or putting more efforts in that, on that specific farm. But from our perspective, we think it is a constant process where we need to keep looking at and monitoring the growth of the specific crop so that we can provide the appropriate inputs to the farmer as well, all right? So basically we take the input from the satellite imagery and then we also request farmer to providing the ground fluting information. We take these two points and then we look at the crop life cycle information as in like, if it is X, Y, Z number of days from when the sowing happened, where is the crop supposed to be at and where it is at, right? And based on that, we try to educate the farmer on how they can manage the risk by maybe adopting certain new techniques or what other farmers are doing within their region, things like that. Essentially, we have this dashboard where they can go in there and see where they are at in the crop life cycle and what they, they have done right and what are the improvement areas, right? So as I said, even though this does not provide us any direct revenue, we think this is the best way wherein we can keep in constant touch with the consumer and be able to build the trust and the long-term relationship with them, right? And then last step is like, when there is loss actually happen, right? It's, it's like the time when the farmer would want to least consider about worrying about insurance, filing the claims and uh, being paid for their claim, right? So what we are trying to do is we our claim management to basically we leverage the spatial data, right? And uh, if there is a natural calamity or any unforced circumstance happened within a region where we service, we look at the imagery uh, of that specific farm and we will be able to assess the damage and determine what the extent of the damage is and the claim amount to be dispersed. And we are in the process of uh, automating the whole process wherein in some instances, farmer might not have to worry about filing the claim and the system would be able to look at the data and decide like, oh yeah, this is where a loss has happened. So the process will need to be triggered, right? And in the event where the farmer really had to submit a claim, our claim, our goal is to settle the claim in at most a week, if not less, right? And again, as you can see, pretty much everything in here at every step, all of this is possible because we are able to leverage the information that's available out there, right? And we are able to train the system to make the educated decision with manual intervention. Uh, basically, whenever we reduce manual intervention, that removes the variability in the process, right? Which there is quite a bit in today's uh, market, right? So we are trying to eliminate most of the middle tiers and have a direct interface with the consumer wherein they can reap the benefits of what we are trying to do with this whole digital platform, right? Yes, yeah, so basically when we ran this and the initial feedback that we have received so far from the farmers is that the, they see the benefits far outweigh any concern about the potential risks of Shema harvesting this information, 
right? So going back to the question like, hey, should big companies be harvesting all this data, right? I mean, yes, as long as it is helping all the parties involved in the ecosystem, right? So. Yeah, I, I mean, and this is fascinating. Thank you, Rajesh. That's really, that's incredibly, and I think you're raising some interesting questions and points. I, I mean, and what stands out to me when I look at Shema is that there is a business alignment. And I think this came up in one of the questions, right? Like you're an insurance company, the more prepared your customers are in terms of mitigating risks, the mm -hmm. likely, you know, the, there is a business model linkage associated with building farmer resilience by sharing data and sharing mm -hmm. back analysis in interesting ways. And there is also just the trust and customer acquisition aspect to your business model, right? How do you differentiate your, your model from other competitors that you're competing with other general insurance companies? So there's a clear alignment of also interests in terms of and doing what is right and adding value to farmers. And I think that's great. That's, that is fantastic. I want to, and I don't know, Josh and Jonathan, this kind of leads me to thinking, and this was also a question that came up from the audience, right? Like, how do we, from the perspective of the ag tech service providers, right? Like, are there other business models that you've seen where, you know, you just do this because there's just more of a natural alignment? Are there, and are there, and therefore a corollary of that is, are there like specific conditions where it just becomes harder, where actually sharing transparency participant actually goes against the business model interests? Of the set, like so, what conditions make farmer centric data governance just more difficult? I think is the question. Um, Jonathan, maybe I lead with you, and Josh, you're welcome to comment on it if you have thoughts. But jo Jonathan, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting question. I think more generally, we see that uh, practice uh, and and academic research has shown that like. I mean, from a general perspective, uh, not so much as the work what Josh is doing, but like uh, we see that digital agriculture is 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 sort of reinforcing a lot of our Western like uh, industrialized uh, agricultural production system, and little is known yet still uh, looking at all that, uh, that that literature on the effects of of of, of data, of big data in agriculture. Uh, though, although it is it is considered one, like in one. The, the, the four factor of production like with land and labor and capital. But data extraction, extraction in the form of uh, you know, big data initiatives uh, generally defines the current data economy. And within this uh, you know, dominant paradigm, uh, many developers see individuals and community only as data points and producers and uh, not as data consumers. So this underscores the limited considerations of equity, I believe, and, um, and, and those most likely to benefit from the data also more, uh, more likely to use it in self-interested and exploitative ways. Um, something else that we encountered um, according to our interviewees is that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, um, the data extraction results in sort, sort of data fatigue that farmers experience. Uh, mm -hmm. when they have to answer the surveys over and over again, now often with the same question. And as a result, some have become reluctant to share data and also placing them in a, in a position to sort of forego access to, to these beneficial services. Uh, you know, because farmers do not trust that the data collected, for example, is certain in the end, and they are hesitant to adopt new, new technologies. But it's, this further limits the access to these uh, beneficial services, uh, you know, which in turn has implications for uh, eco-economic inclusion and growth within the X sector. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe Charger want to add something to and, and John, you were breaking a little bit for me oh. um, on that response. So I just meant, wanted to just flag that just to see if there's an internet thing that needs to be fixed. But Josh, you're welcome to come in if you had any observation on that as well, in terms of where is it harder to make this work? Yeah, I think, I'm, I mean, it's a challenge across the board, realistically, because just in terms of where expectations are, right? So if you look at expectations of um, investors, the, the expectation of a lot of investors is that the money comes from the data. <laughs> so, you know, you want to control that as a company as much as you can so that you can generate uh, 
profit off of that, essentially, or revenues off of that. Um, and that's what investors are looking for. So therefore, you know, especially startups who are in the space, then they end up having to cater to where the money is and what the expectations of those who have uh, money uh, are. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's also the question of sort of what any individual will accept and what is optimized, what's optimal for um, sort of shared value as we look to a, you know, building an economy where everyone is able to have opportunities within it. Um, so, you know, I agree with Rajesh that I think a lot of people are just resigned to the fact that, well, people have my data anyway, so what am I gonna do? Um, if they even know that, I mean, some if we're talking about, you know, people who are just getting online for the first time, they might not even know or have an understanding of how is their data being collected? How is it being used? Um, you know, and, but I think the fact that they don't know or they're resigned to that doesn't mean that that should be the path that, you know, we have to follow. Um, so, and that's not, I'm not criticizing um, Rajesh, what your model is, but just to note, to flag on that point, um, I think that, you know, it's, there are a lot of potential benefits for innovators in actually having a more farmer-centric or user-centric approach to data governance. Um, you know, if you're centering control over the data with the individual whose data it is, you can actually decrease some of the inefficiencies that uh, companies face in terms of data collection, right? If rather than yeah. if each company has to collect the data themselves versus the individual has the data and they can share it with company A, company B, company C, that's a reduced cost for those companies. You know, that has potentially um, opens up pathways for innovation because it lowers the cost of entry um, to some companies. So I think, you know, it's about rethinking, you know, what, what the model can look like, not only thinking about what has it looked like, you know, and I think, you know, AI is a great example here where like these people are really having this, you know, um, moment of realization of how generative AI is potentially going to really transform the economy and, and power in ways that could be, you know, pretty potentially dangerous or uneven. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to be asking those questions and think about how do we come up with models that are more equitable and ultimately benefit everyone and their shared value from it. And it's not playing into um, power dynamics that already, there's already an imbalance, as Jonathan said, you know, smallholder farmers have an imbalance of power. So if we just develop models based on what they'll accept, as opposed to what is actually sort of, you know, right and what is seeking to you know provide them an equal seat at the table um i think you know those are sorts of things we have to think about anyway let me stop there no thank you and i and i just i really love the point and something i'd love to find other ways to be beyond this conversation unpack and talk about josh is how to optimize values and systems that work for a group rather than having to figure it out case by case and the case by case instances help inform some of the group level ideas, systems, practices, models of lowering costs of doing this well, because there are these ways of doing it that we agree on as a group. Because and this is something we've talked about with a lot of private sector players that we work with at Athena, which is there is an opportunity, even in their existing model without spending more money to do literacy and empower, empower their sort of last mile, um, customers about their data rights because they're already in the field. For example, I know Rajesh Shima has 80,000 odd correspondents in the field selling and engaging with us and doing this in 16 different languages. Uh, it's so custom because it is so aligned with the business model. You have to be super customized. You have to cater to the local cultural context, the language. It's not a blanket thing. It's And you, you have the infrastructure there already. 
without necessarily, you're just leveraging that infrastructure to do a little bit more that we think is the right thing to do because then the farmers start asking important questions when they're asked to fill a survey up the next time by an agency. I, I do think there's a literacy angle there that doesn't cost a ton of money. Like there is an educated literacy aspect to it. And I'm, I'm and I know that a lot of it also, and I this is probably a, a good good segue to the discussion on consent, right? Because there's been so much thinking and discussion. Um, I know while and jo Jonathan, you mentioned this is not something that the report went into explicitly perhaps but so much of it starts and that literacy starts with how do you share with the farmer what rights he or she has vis-a-vis -vis the information that's being asked of them and the participation begins there right like consent is often one of the first steps i'm curious rajesh maybe this is i'd love to hear what how is shema thinking about for instance consent and and then jonathan and josh i'd love to hear from you on what you think are some good practices out there um, in the industry that get that right because i feel these are the operational entry points for the private sector again to say you're not doing new things you're just doing things differently a little bit it's cost you money but it's to have a substantial impact on how farmers see their own role in agency in the context of data but Rajesh, I'd like to start with you on the on con concept of content, how Shema is approaching it. And then I'd love to hear from Jonathan and Josh as well. Sure. Th thanks. Uh, so, I, I mean, to uh, address Josh's earlier point, right? So when we talk about data ownership and who can have access to what kind of data, right? So it also comes with a cost, right? So ma maintaining and managing and sharing data, it's, it's for an individual, it might not be as trivial as it is for a company, right? So it's it's always a two-way street, right? So basically the customer will be sharing their information and then the company will be using it and providing a better service to the customer, right? So at the end of the day, we feel that the transparency is the key here, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically, as long as the customer knows exactly how their data is being used and uh, what is the value they're getting out of it, we think they are really open to sharing the information and making sure um, they get value out of it, right? Uh, so that's the first aspect of it. And then the second aspect of it is like, uh, uh, how do we secure the information from within the platform itself, right? So basically, uh, what we do is we, uh, so basically one is like, obviously what the farmer has shared. The second is like, how do they get access to the information that they have shared, right? That's their entry point. And this is where the two-factor authentication, the face IDs, all those things would come into play, right? Wherein, which would help them see that, hey, whatever we are sharing, it's not just out there for everyone to access. Instead, it is restricted for them. And there is a right way for them to get to that information, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last mm -hmm. most important, Right, whatever need to happen in the back end within the systems themselves, right? These the end users would not be able to see, as in like who has access to what, what kind of access protections, the encryptions that are implemented and things like that, right? But they do play in a big part in this whole infrastructure because one misstep there would lose the complete trust that has been built so far, right? So we look at this as a three-step process, right? So basically. Uh, where do we collect the information from and how do we make sure that the user has proper access to that information using controls, right? And how is the backend taking care of protecting this data, right? Here, Rajesh, Jonathan and Josh, love to hear your perspectives on what, what are some good practices on concept? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, we have, we have actually a few case studies that really look at this. Uh, uh, uh -huh. and, and, and have some very interesting pointers. Uh, just to briefly go back on uh, something and build on what, what uh, Josh just said about like, uh, you know, uh, like you mentioned that like contracts and privacy policies uh, between businesses and farmers usually specify in the terms of use how data can be used. And they typically seek to protect privacy uh, via type data control, but uh, but still, the, the 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 fairness of farm data use is is very lightly regulated, globally speaking. Right, contracts may provide may not provide actually for for su sufficient safeguards uh, to to protect data rights, uh, and and we see things like click 
uh, agreement, right? Uh, signifying con uh, some kind of consent uh, in a data license. Um, and these data licenses are often very complex and lengthy and non-negotiable uh, agreements. Um, so research also suggests that agreements generally do not specify a particular allowable data use, um, including by third parties. So in that potential uh, corporate gains typically drive how these companies use uh, the collective farm data. And this gives companies a privileged position uh, with unique insights. And the more vertically integrated uh, the ag industry is or becomes, uh, the tighter these uh, contractual relationships uh, tend to be. And we've seen this in examples with John Deere, uh, for example, and uh, also in the past with Safaricom in Kenya. Um, there, there are plenty of other uh, examples as well, but um, yeah, the, the convoluted nature of, 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 of these contract leaves, leaves farmers with little ability to negotiate data governance. And I think therefore the, the, some of the approaches that we highlight in a report try to counter this, I, I believe, and, 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 and provide with some uh, opportunities to sort of uh, counter these highly technical or sometimes obscure or far-reaching contracts. Um, yeah, um, what also is worth maybe noting is that the fact that many ag tech providers in low and middle income countries are foreign owned and may also affect farmers trust and conditions in their contextual uh, terms of use and, you know, for example, the laws of a country uh, in which the company is, is, is registered often governs uh, the license agreement and that outlines data sharing and data use practices. Um, which then can create uncertainty over farmers' legal protection. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, John. Do, uh, Josh, do you want to do the piece on consent and how, yeah, what some good practices are? Yeah, I mean, I think, so definitely the inclination that a lot of uh, organizations and companies have around uh, consent is, Keep it as broad as possible because you never know how you're going to want to use the data. Like I get that. I yeah. get that. You know, I used to work for an organization that the photo consent form that they used said that you know we have the right to use your likeness in any way we want in perpetuity. And you know, I saw that and I was like, this makes this doesn't make any sense. Like if we're taking somebody's picture for this purpose. That should be the only way that we're using that picture and we should make that clear to them you know and so you know we in that case i just created a separate form that said you know we are only going to use your photo for this so you know exactly how it's going to be used um you know i think i get the the reason why people don't want to do that because mm -hmm. if you decide you want to use the data for something else later then it can become costly to then go back to every single individual and say, actually, we'd like to use your data for something else. So, you know, please give us permission because people might not actually do it. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's lots of other things in society that we require things that are maybe not the most convenient to a single party um, or a single set of parties because it is what is more just sort of collectively. Um, and so I, I think this is one that we really have to think about is, I mean, at the very least to Rajesh's point, like you have to be transparent about what is it, and it should be in a language that's understandable, not buried in, you know, long legalese terms and conditions that are privacy policies that nobody ex without a law degree understands. Um, you know, so it should be simple. It should be in a language that the people who are reading it understand it should be very transparent. Um, personally, this is my personal opinion, not you know USAID's position, but personally, I think that uh, companies should think about confining how they are using data to the purposes that they actually need it for, rather than these broad blanket agreements. Um, I understand the hassle of doing that, but I think that there are creative ways to address that that can make the, um, you know, can give more uh, control to uh, the individual while also not restricting the companies in their, uh, you know, need to use 
certain parts of certain data points. Yeah, I know. And I, you know, we joke about this even while, as, you know, consumers of content and participants on on the internet every day. I, I, the constant policy always like is crazy, Josh, right? Like in John and Rajesh, I have, they're like, accept all or go into this 12 page document to modify what you're consenting. And I'm like, I don't have, I want to access that article and I don't have the time to go over a 12 page piece of legally. So sometimes you can operationalize the principle, but operationalize it in a way where you are actually doing it just so that you can exploit certain behaviors that you take for granted. You know they will not take them. They're going to do and accept all. So in principle, you've operationalized GDPR, right? Like, but it's not really in, in spirit consistent with giving the participant more. So the reject all is only on a few websites, right? So it's just not as much. And I think that's such an important, I think the spirit, and I I, I feel like something that would be fascinating to think about as, as a in the sector is really, values and templates, because I know when we talk to the private sector organizations, they're also struggling to find, they're doing a million things and they're like, what's a good template I can borrow and what's a value I can go back to and save and, and build that into organizational practices. And I think that's maybe something to, to think about and consider um, for a couple of key operational aspects of operationalizing uh, these pharma-centric data governance models. I know we have like another less than 15 minutes on this call, so I'm going to move and sort of do a little bit of the thinking ahead and you know what does this mean as we're continuing to work together and, and build forward from here and i think one of the things that jonathan that comes out from your work and the report that you did with supported by uscid gates and dai was this sort of this constant conflict or this this tension between efficiency innovation equity uh, and costs right so there's just this how do you balance that? And I think these, and at any point you want to find a way where, just as an example, right? As there is more vertical and horizontal consolidation of ag tech service providers, costs did come down. There is a clear affordability and you address because cost structures shift. You're able to deliver, and that's partly because of the efficiencies, but also suddenly they have more control data. They're just more powerful and there's just more of a power asymmetry. So how do we, what are some, interesting trends or ways in which we can balance this sort of this tension between equity, innovation, efficiency, and costs. Uh, I'd love to maybe Jonathan stop with you and then Rajesh and Josh, if you have some remarks on that, you're welcome to, welcome to, yeah, also share, but Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, to build on actually what just said and what you said, um, I think these are, these are great questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, ag tech companies are more integrated than ever. We've talked about this now. Um, they're integrated, decentralized, uh, uh, vertically integrated, um, in, and they increasingly become more popular and sort of the standalone uh, apps, applications. Um, and this obviously, uh, you know, results in some, uh, some power imbalance. Um, uh, on the one hand, technically well, speaking, I'm uh, so sorry. I think your voice is still picking up. I don't know, Rajesh, Josh, can you hear Jonathan clearly? You can't. Okay, go ahead then. Sorry. Oh, okay. Your no, you can't. Is... We can't hear you clearly. Okay. Unfortunately, is there like an internet you could switch or connection? Not sure. Or maybe try. I try again, and hopefully it will yeah. work. Or I can. Have Rajesh and Josh Wayne while we wait. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Do you want to try again? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll I'll try again. I'm I'm not sure what's the what the problem uh, exactly is. Um. So we can. I was saying time. like, yeah. Okay. Um. I was saying so. On on the one hand, technically speaking, you know, uh, at a tech platform can inform. I can offer many positive features like openness and interoperability and network effects mm -hmm. and control for market entry and participation and the ability to reshape economic relationships and uh, rationalities. But uh, these platforms also lock in farmers at top down as we, as we discussed. Um, maybe what I, I, I kind of like want to sort of highlight as well is on a more positive note is uh, 
and it's one of the case studies that, that we that we worked on uh, with uh, joint data. It's an interesting example. Uh, it's mobilization in Netherlands, and actually one of the partners is Corbin as well. Uh, and it's um, it's the first data cooperative that uh, you know dedicated to batch farmers, and uh, would aim to make sure that you know any farmers can pull con uh, control and. Uh, connect and share data in a sort of safe and secure, secure and fair way uh, with other ag agribusinesses and innovation innovation partners and, and and financial institutions, and to make sure that the data benefits flow back to the farmer, to the individual farmer. Um, you know, historically, Dutch farming is leading the way when it comes to like innovation and efficiency. However, like the the uh, the use of data among individual farmers is still quite fragmented and siloed. So farmers often don't know, you know, to whom or for which purpose they authorize their data use. Um, and they become reluctant, uh, reasonably reluctant to share their data. Um, and cooperatives have, have played an, an important role in the economic uh, emancipations of, of large group, uh, groups of the population, see Robert Bank itself, right? It's, and it's no wonder that then the first data cooperative has grown from collaborations between uh, different agribusinesses and knowledge institutions and farmers with the purpose of simulating innovations on farm. And based on this, this co-op concept, the aim is to connect all parties to enable farmers to gain uh, sort of maximum benefit and, and, and retain control over their own data and organizations. So they're bringing all authorizations together digitally on the platform uh, to help farmers with an overview and give farmers to, uh, sort of to, to the option to manage their authorizations at any time. And then farmers can decide uh, who and for what purpose that data will be used. Um, and there's lessons here that we can, you know, that we, that we can learn from uh, across the globe, uh, especially for countries that have similar, uh, you know, uh, a similar culture regarding cooperatives. Uh, and uh, we build other uh, other case studies in this and in South Africa and in and, and, and Mexico. Uh, so this is an interesting sort of an interesting example that I think is worth highlighting. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for now. Um, Thanks, Jonathan. I think I think just for I mean, really, the book is on, for example, models like data cooperatives and how that's shifting and achieving some of the goals around efficiency and cost, but also giving farmers more agency and control. I think it's a really important one. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, Josh and Rajesh, are there like trends that you think is promising in terms of being able to just still achieve the cost efficiency aspects and but at the same time, just in, be more inclusive to give them agency and control? And of course, and have, oh, how their data is being used to benefit from it. Josh, you want to go ahead? Sure. I, I mean, I think, you know, there's, I'll, I would point to just in the interest of time, um, looking at, I think there were nine case studies or, or so from the, the report, um, the Farmer Central Data Governance Report. I think those are a great place to start because they look at some of the ways that these different models are being implemented in practice. Um, I think, um, you know, I don't know. This maybe is a question to Rajesh and, and maybe you, Deepa. Um, I know some years ago, like in India, for example, they were the government was trying to work on this data locker. I think they were calling it. I forget, you know, but, but basically where individuals would have that control over their data, then they can sort of on a permission based share. You know, some of that thing, some of those things do require more national level infrastructure to enable. Um, potentially, I mean, you know, Estonia is a is an example of a country that has built some of that national level infrastructure um, to enable that sort of uh, that more efficient sharing, but that's also more permissions based and more sort of um, centered around the user. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know, there's there's some private sector examples out there uh, that are doing this sort of thing as well, enabling individuals. Um, to have greater control over their data, um, but doing that because they see profit potential in doing that. They, they see that there's actually, you know, when you give consumers an alternative to the standard model that, they're, um, that there's potentially interest there. 
Um, so let me, I'll stop there in the interest of time. Rajesh, I want to maybe give you a minute and then go to and go to the closing, but go ahead, Rajesh. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think like everyone said, right? You, you, for us to have like individual control on the data for the citizens themselves, it need to be a broader initiative at the government or uh, at the country level, right? So because the cost to benefit uh, uh, is going to be very minimal if an individual has to do it all by themselves, right? Whereas if it's an initiative at a higher level, it, it, it propagates a lot faster, right? But with regards to vertical integration, I think that is absolutely required for industry to thrive because not one company can do everything, right? Say for example, Shema is partnering with banks, right? So that we can get the people who otherwise might not have got the loans would get the loans because now they have insurance, right? The biggest challenge there is that there is not going to be one size fit all solution, right? And the interoperability, right? So I think that's where some standardization need to happen and we need to bring in as many participants as possible to the marketplace so that there is enough uh, value for everyone, including the consumer in there, right? So. Yeah, lovely. I Yeah, I, and that's really practical and helpful. Rajesh, I want to, I think this is also a really nice segue and I just think questions come up from the audience as well, which is, so what do we want the government to be doing now, right? Like we know about the threats, we know the concerns, we know that this is not a problem that we can expect companies to figure out by themselves. You do need public goods, like, did, like and when I say these, these could take different forms in terms of our systems or acts or policies that people can embrace. Uh, so, and, and Josh, I'm gonna really come to you to help us close this out from based on perspectives on the role of the government. I think I, I'd like to stop there. And then the role of the private sector. Uh, I, 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 these are the two critical players I feel. And, I, and then there is agencies like USAID as a donor that can come in to provide some facilitation, technical assistance, that sort of a thing. So I'd love to just hear government, what your perspectives are on the role of the government and the private sector primarily, and also what the vision for USAID is as you are thinking to grow and uh, strengthen the space. Josh, please go ahead. Sure, so I will try to very quickly answer that uh, looking at the clock. Um, so I think for governments, I mean, there's, there's a need to reassess um, some of the regulatory, legal, and, and policy frameworks. I mean, Jonathan, you know, talked about some of that, um, you know, and really make sure that they are enabling um, adequate protections of uh, of data, um, sort of more broadly. You know, even not even looking at it from a perspective of former centric um, data governance. I think from a, a private sector perspective, you know, I would really encourage private sector actors to uh, experiment with some of these um, approaches. I think that you will find that, and I think, you know, Rajesh spoke to this a little bit, um, you know, you'll find that that builds trust and loyalty with your customers. If your customers see that you are treating them with respect, you're not, you know, trying to um, sort of set up an, an imbalance uh, power dynamic. Um, you're providing them with, uh, with services that they need and you're doing so in a transparent way in terms of what how you're using their data, what you're doing. Um, I think that they'll find in the long run that to be a, um, a value add um, or distinguishing you know, characteristic. Uh, for donors, you know, I think there's um, one is just being aware that there are these these things, this whole thing that exists, that there's not just a standard model, that there are other, you know, why does data governance matter? How does it relate to priorities that, you know, donors might have as it relates to things like inclusion um, or localization um, or economic empowerment, um, because they're very much interlinked. Um, and I think donors can do things like, you know, provide um, support for experimenting with some of these models, you know, encourage their partners to, to try them. Um, you know, I'm not 
not speaking on behalf of USAID doing these things, but just saying, you know, these are things generally where I think that, you know, and yeah, yeah and really just to help to buy down some of the, the cost of experimenting with um, and working the kinks out of some of these approaches that are still less tested than the, the more common yeah. uh, model, you know, that we discussed. Awesome. I know we're a minute over time, but this has been, I've had fun. This was awesome. I think, thank you all, Jonathan, Rajesh, Josh, for the candor, the honesty, the amazing perspectives. Thanks to the team at IDH and IntelliCap and the organizers who brought us together um, and for organizing this really interesting and sort of um, stimulating series of dialogues and conversations. So you just bring such different perspectives together. And the audience for taking time out in late evening, if you're joining from Asia um, or East Africa, to, to, yeah, to share your perspectives and questions with us as well and for joining us and listening in. So this is, thank you all so very much. And I look forward to seeing how we can keep building on from these dialogues. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.